Welcome to the My Name is Human Earth2.io podcast brought to you by E2.news. My name is Human Hazy. And my name is Human Kangi. And we have a special guest with us today, uh, Admiral Hydra of the Kraken Guild. And he's, we're going to kind of get a little background about you. Tell, tell us a little bit about who you are, what you do, where you're from. Kind of let us know who, what you're about. Okay. Hi, fellas. Good, great to be here. Thanks for having me. So a, bit of, a little bit about me. So um, I specifically joined Earth2 um, in January, so a little bit late to the party. Um, I'm an Australian fellow and I, I heard about um, Shane through a couple of friends. And then um, coincidentally, I um, got asked through my E1 job to perform some due diligence on the Earth2 company. Really? Uh, uh, before yeah. I'm going to interject here. Yes. All right. Why, why did they want you to do due diligence on Earth too? I uh, can't can't exactly say, but it was a it was a financial and uh, kind of business operations due diligence. Um, and everyone has secrets. <laughs> All right. Yes. Well, I mean, that's the best kind of guest, right? He's coming right out of the <laughs> gates with tantalizing secrets. So. <laughs> all right car carry on sorry for the interruption no all good all good so look when i'm when i'm asked to perform due diligence i like to do a couple of things so i think the first one is is broadly check out the company the legals and um you know what their structure is where they're based who's who in the zoo um so shane and his partners i um, think the second part of that is really just having a bit of a play around with the game Unfortunately, in this instance, I went to play the game and I uh, got a little bit addicted over the first uh, 48 hours and I was no longer a suitable candidate to do due diligence anymore. So, um... <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I was going to say you're, you're number 15 on the leaderboard with about 75,000 invested. So uh, you've definitely gotten a little addiction there <laughs> just a just a tiny one and it, it, there may be a few more accounts too but uh <laughs> but yeah you would you would put yourself in a bit of a conflict of interest uh position i see <laughs> so what what is your real job work can you not say that either i can't really say that so i work for a um financial technology company so we'll okay that one but um yeah we, we have a look at um at companies like this all the time um yeah, particularly particularly ones that are entering um, or about to enter the crypto space potentially um, or have some fundamentals which look like they will. Understood. Well, you know, one thing that I'm super curious about as far as uh, your background is, you know, we're, we introduced you, you're Admiral Hydra of the Kraken. And uh, I'm, I'm curious, you know, you, you mentioned when you got involved and how quickly you got addicted within that first 48 hours, but how did you get involved uh, with the Kraken and what, what attracted you to that particular guild? Yeah, sure. So look, um, I've got to say that the first place that I, I think, and a lot of people would, would probably go to is um, Nameless and uh, Tech Ops' stream. And I, I did spend a lot of time there for a few weeks um, and, I, and I was guildless. And, and I quickly started to say that, you know, the guilds, whether it's, you know, Dork Slayer, whether it's Alpha Kingdom, you know, SHP, et cetera, you know, they had a lot of cohesion and traction amongst their members. And I, I did start to have a bit of a look around. And at that particular time, Smodge, who is the founder of the Kraken, approached me and we had a bit of a chat on um, just out, out of the E2 general discord. And we actually got along really well. And he's another Aussie. And, you know, I think you've got to stick together in, in some ways. But, yeah, I kind of got involved in the Kraken for, for, two, for two reasons, primarily because of Smodge. And the second one is because I just really love pirates. <laughs> and um, I, was, I was dead Arr! keen on... Yeah, exactly right. Yeah, <laughs> I, mean, I was kind of dead keen on getting involved with something piratey. Wanted to do so all my life, really. So <laughs> aspirations ticked. I mean, so, that, that's a, there's a lot to be said about the aesthetic of a guild attracting somebody that's in the top 20 on the leaderboard, right? So that's <laughs> anybody out there that's got uh, ideas or plans for a guild, uh, you know, take your theme all the way. You might attract somebody with some serious coin. 
hundred percent. But I'm sorry, Hazy, I cut you off there. I was going to say, so what is kind of the long-term vision of the Kraken? I mean, I, I know we've talked about this, but kind of explain what, what the Kraken is kind of after, what they're doing, what their kind of goal on or to is. Yeah, sure. So I think primarily the the vision of the Kraken is is to become a, a kind of a pirate family um, as such. So, you know, I think the way historically pirates worked is, you know, it was all for one and one for all kind of, kind of arrangement so i think at the base and core of the guild it's really about supporting each other and developing cool things together and and really sharing in the profits and also in the plundering um above that you know i think the focus of the kraken is is really about entertainment um and also furthering the pirate theme so i'm real i'm really disappointed why <laughs> i i thought i thought the goal was to destroy Chavistopia. <laughs> <laughs> well, we've got to keep some secrets up our sleeves, don't we? <laughs> that's one of the sub bullets. That's a sub. That's a sub task. <laughs> well, supposedly we also want to make war on Dorkslayer as well. So there's there's lots of there's lots of um war themes involved, and I'm sure there'll be plenty of friendly and and unfriendly battles <laughs> as the game. Uh, I hate I hate to disappoint you, but Kingy and I have a, a motto here. It's called opt out. <laughs> we're trying to stay as neutral as possible uh, i'm a conscientious objector or as or as bender would say in this instance i'm just being a coward but <laughs> but that's okay with me i don't i, I don't want to risk uh in like a game of pink slips my land against the kraken that's where i'm at <laughs> don't don't you worry. We get along with, get along with everyone at the moment. So even Dog Slayer, we love Dog Slayer. So <laughs> we'll be fine. That, that's the real ulterior motive for Hazy and I starting this podcast is just to get on everyone's good side before the PvP starts. <laughs> it's very but, smart. Yeah. <laughs> but so so we all know about the new guy on the block, the Joker. He's just buying tiles left and right. And what what kind of impact does someone that comes in and buys a hundred thousand dollars worth of tiles have on on guilds in particular? Yeah, I think it's a I think it's an interesting question. You know, uh, you know, I think you know inv investors or whales or whatever you want to call them, like Joker. You know, they they add a little bit of notoriety to the game, and and that I think that's definitely an attraction card and. And I think over the past week, you've probably seen um, some of this notoriety kind of come to the fore in terms of certain players' investments in cities like Ziggurat and stuff. So that's all very exciting. I think the, these players, you know, they're, they're cool. People want to follow them. And, and I, think it's, I think it's awesome that they're coming to join the game and, and there's that interest there and people are willing to put their coin down behind the game. It really firstly gives people confidence. I think really in terms of competing with guilds, you know, just, just like anyone, whether it's a, it's Joker or whether it's, you know, um, a massive corporation coming in, there is an element of trust um, that, you know, that, that they have to compete with in, in terms of guilds. So like, you know, in the crack and we've got, and we've got 600 members and we've got a core team who trust each other implicitly and, and are very cohesive and, I guess, successful in, in working to, together as a high energy and, and high performance team. So I think the first challenge for these guys is, is, is how do they compete with something like that? And, you know, money will only take you so far. I think the second element is is really essence and resource resource generation. Like, if you look, you know, at the guilds, like even if you look at you know Dork Slayer as, as an example, not wanting to call them out, but you know they've got and I'm not wanting to swear, so I'm um, just trying <laughs> to read it. But I've got tons of tiles everywhere, and there is a volume of tiles in that guild and in in all the guilds that is very hard to replicate in terms of essence generation, especially if that is done in a coordinated way. So, you know, whereas, you know, people like Joker or, or corporations or, or other whales and, and stuff can, can, you know, deploy their resources to, to buying really cool properties, perhaps when it comes to gameplay that there may be certain challenges which they need to overcome. And yes, they're probably my two, my two key 
points. Um, I think the, the last one is the ability to monetize. So how are they going to get people interested in their projects? How are they going to, you know, rally um, people to their to their flag when they want to build staff or when they want to do a joint initiative? And that and that really remains to be seen. Yeah, I mean, there's a you you've put a ton on the floor that uh, is really exciting to talk about. I think the the first one I would like to jump on is just that last part about sort of resource sharing and pooling, or essence mm. sharing, where you know it's not something I'd spend a lot of time considering, but with some of these larger uh, guilds and larger megacity projects, um, if we have a particularly complex set of resources, say we have 50, 60, 80 type, you know. 80 different resources with which to build, it's going to be so much easier to source that if you have a larger guild with five, 600 people that maybe have pretty diverse portfolios versus, you know, only having just a few people or certainly only just yourself, it's going to be so much harder uh, to accrue those things if, if the builds are particularly complex, right? Um, then not to mention just the, the, the sort of ease of trading and the, the, as you mentioned, the built-in trust there, you don't have to uh, convince somebody that you have their best interests in mind in a trading situation if you're if you're part of a guild. I say this not being in one, so this is from the outside, outside looking in, admittedly. Yeah, 100%. There, there, there's a, a bit, look, I, I think, you know, I think everything will, will be able to be workable in the platform in some way. I just get the feeling that it will be a little bit more paid to play for some of these players versus, um, you know, a bit more of a collaborative effort. And, you know, there are obviously benefits to, to each path. Right. Right. Yeah. And I mean, you mentioned with, with the Joker, you know, money will only take you so far. It'll be interesting to see uh, with some of these, you know, cities that, that he's now a part of and that folks are flocking to uh, whether sort of a cohesive strategy can be imposed. Right. Because people may be, just chasing where he's going for strictly monetary reasons and not really have much uh, in the way of like goals for any of whatever his projects might be. Uh, whereas I think the, the, the Kraken or Dork Slayer might be a little bit more uh, unified in their vision. But to be seen, to be seen. Maybe I'm not giving Joker enough credit. Hmm. I, I think, um, yeah, it's, it's very true. I think one of the interesting parts is, you know, no matter where joke is gone he has seemingly created value or perhaps you know an aspiration element like you know what started off as a, a simple map of the world in in ziggurat now has a three thousand five hundred dollar joker own tile sitting in the middle of it now you know is that it, obviously the sales within that map have gone up significantly over the past week. There's been a lot of interest in, in, you know, in, in Ziggurat itself. And, you know, that, that's kind of cool. It's kind of cool for the city owners and it's kind of a testament to their, I guess, forward planning and, and articulation of their goal and strategy in the game. And, and the value has been created through that investment. So I think in, in some ways, you know, that these whales can, can definitely help, with that element and that engagement, that community engagement element and bringing that bit of, you know, flair to, to what is already in the game. Yeah, that's interesting. So the one thing I'm kind of curious about with, with guild, there's so many popping up. How, how can a guild make themselves stand out to someone that is picking from 50 that are out there? Yeah. Well, I think it's the same with all businesses or organizations. It's about differentiation. So, you know, it's about, you know, what, what are your core values? What are you, what are you trying to achieve in the game? What's your purpose? You know, I think uh, I'm cognizant of the fact that not everyone is, you know, a, a war person. I'm cognizant of the fact that not everyone here is a designer and a creative, um, you know, and, and it's, it's how you pull these various elements together to make it into something that benefits everyone. And that's really I guess <clears throat> the core benefits as well as the challenges for a guild versus individuals. So I, I think <clears throat> if you look at Dork Slayer, you know, like them or not, they have a real singular focus and they have a really, um, you know, a, a nice guild feel um, and it, that's full of, you know, people who are really interested in competitive gaming and are just real hustlers, <laughs> you know? And, and I think, 
those people seem to be aligned with each other, which is which is cool. And 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 I think it just allows them to advance further in the game with people of similar interests. Right. And they've obviously you have Dork Slayer, Alpha Kingdom, the Kraken have a very distinct sort of presence, at least in the uh, Discord, in the, the Earth 2 IO Discord, which is currently the only place where a real distinct identity can be carved right now, at least till uh, phase two gets started, maybe. But, um, but you know, I think that those are huge reasons that the numbers for those guilds continue to climb is that, you know, I think that they're very identifiable. And, you know, use of shared avatars or even like uh, shared sort of uh, voice and the way that they communicate with people, uh, I think, can go a long way. Hmm. Before, before we wrap up on guilds, I did have one more question I wanted to ask about it. And it's basically actually two questions, uh, two parts. Why do you think guilds are important on Earth 2? And what kind of support do you want to see the Earth 2 development team give guilds? Like, what can they do to help you? Yeah. So well, I think <clears throat> at least in the initial stages of the game, guilds are really important to the platform for acquisition um, of new players. And and also, uh, I guess, what a lot of people call in, in the industry is like early months on books. So, so really keeping that engagement up for players when they're in their nascency on a platform. So I think, you know, Earth 2 obviously isn't really outwardly promoting at all um, at the moment, whereas the Guild, Facebook, Instagram, Reddits, Discords are very active and it really it really allows people to firstly get involved, secondly understand what the game's about and thirdly make, I guess, well thought out investments. Um, I think <clears throat> towards the mid game, Guilds are going to be really about in- engagement and um uh, again, continued engagement as well as cohesive building and cohesive, you know, whether it's PVP or um, resource gathering or, or other strategies that, you know, that will be developed in the game in time. Um, in terms of what I'd like to see the game <clears throat> do to support guilds, I think, you know, you see Dork Slayer, Kraken and a number of other guilds have, I guess, or cities have coordinated investment strategies, which are, really articulated through um, a centralised bank or a centralised account where where either referral income is pulled or E1 income from, say, things like merchandise sales and, and stuff uh, are pulled. I'd really like to see a game mechanism for that to be, I guess, formalised in, in a way that really shares, uh, shares of people's interest financially um, as well as... <clears throat> you know, just um, the ability to share resources within that bank between players and distribute is really accommodated um, because at the moment <clears throat> it's really it's really hard um, to, to, to articulate the value of a centralised investment pool um, in the game um, other than that maybe in the future we might be able to build stuff together and this will provide a, a mechanism for us to invest as a team. Does, it, does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. Because I have seen uh, certain guilds, um, you know, in their description of themselves, you mention using the referral code that's sort of for their central bank, right? It's not for uh, Smodge or the original creator of the guild. It's it's more for uh, the community as a whole to either, you know, continue to invest in property as the, as it goes or you know, accrue money and potentially use it at a later date when it can be used, like you said, in a way that's a little bit more... Um, easily applied in a community sense than it is today yeah exactly Mm -hmm. i think um the banks are also there potentially for things like resource trading so you know i think obviously we we haven't seen resources come into the game yet but i think i hear we're very near um which is exciting but it'd be nice to to figure out you know whether there is is a way that you know guilds can can kind of trade these resources for building purposes or whatever internally before we seek you know to to trade with external partners. Right, right, yeah. That, that I mean, I think that there are other uh, MMOs and other games where you see that ability to sort of maybe pool resources in a central location and be able to use that, for lack of a better term, that central bank in order to trade, um, mm. but. Yeah, I think we've we've spent a lot of time talking about 
uh, the, the larger guilds and uh, everybody sort of working together for the greater good. Let's let's get down to some individual successes, though, and and sort of what our own what some of our own strategies are. And, and one I know that uh, you wanted to talk about before we got in here, Hydra, was uh, the small nation strategy. Um, and just a, a quick description of that, a quick recap of that strategy uh, for those who may not be familiar, is basically that smaller nations, uh, for example, Holy See or Monaco, Gibraltar, Tuvalu, um, these very, very small nations have an inherently lower supply of tiles. So in a conventional economic model, they're going to run out a lot more quickly, thereby making the demand far higher for those tiles. Um, so that kind of sets the stage, I think, to open up you know, this conversation. And I guess I'll, I'll just start by, by asking you, Hydra, is this a strategy that you yourself have employed? Do you, do you see value in this strategy? Or, or did you commit some subterfuge here? And are you, you coming in to tell me that this is a bad strategy and, and ruin my dreams? <laughs> so yeah, I, I will um, disclose that I I do um, invest heavily in the um, small nation strategy. Okay. Uh, I've I guess there are there are kind of two flavors to my investment. So one is um, a little investment in the um, well, not so little investment in in, in Dork Slayers strategy. So through Gibraltar and Monaco, and the other the other is um, the other investment in the strategy is through my, my central account. So I've got a Holy C um, block. Um, I, I did separate the two because I, I think if you, if you look at Monaco and, and Gibraltar, I think, you know, they're very heavily controlled by, by Dork Slayer. And, and at the end of the day, um, I'm as much a guild player as I am an investor. And, you know, I, I you know, I, I, I do think that the Dork Slayer strategy does have some merit that, that needs to be tested. And, and hence my investment. Um, I think, look, specifically, I think there are two um, classes of small nations. I think there are small nations with high traffic. I think there are small nations with low traffic. And when I say traffic, it's, you know, um, potential for um, alternate reality or just general foot traffic. Um, so you, you really see like the Holy See and, and Monaco, I guess, standing above the rest in terms of that category um, with with states like Tuvalu and, and arguably San Marino being um, the, in that second tier. Yeah, um, yeah. yeah. I, I think that that's a very fair way to compartmentalize it. Sorry, I didn't mean to step on you there. I just no, uh, no, no, no. I do think that um, I just get excited about this sort of breakdown between uh, Holy See, Monaco, and maybe to a lesser extent Gibraltar versus everybody else, just because of the exclusivity, and then you know, especially for Holy See and Monaco, some some cultural and sort of GDP reasons. Um, like you said, the foot traffic in Monaco is far different than than something like uh, San Marino or British Indian Ocean territory. So um, yeah, yeah, and and see, this is where my and this is where Kingy and I always differ. I just don't think foot traffic is going to matter as much on Earth, too. I think you're going to have the Vatican destroyed. Uh, it's not going to be there. So it's, the foot traffic isn't going to matter because it's going to matter what the people put on the tiles. So if they don't put something interesting, people aren't going to go there. And so for me, while I do buy some Tuvalu tiles, I'm not going to overpay for holy see or monaco just because they're scarce countries to me it really is important who's there and what they're going to do there i mean i think that that's that's certainly fair i i and i don't i'm not intimately familiar necessarily with each within these smaller nations what the sort of inner workings are and what maybe say dork slayers plans are within um gibraltar um, but but to your point, Hazy, I will say that you can't necessarily expect these tiles to give you much higher income gener or excuse me resource generation or other perks just because you paid more for it, right? It's got a you're you're assuming or the purchasers of these tiles are assuming some value that goes beyond sort of what their their in game uh, value and and production might be. Um, yeah, and, and a place like Gibraltar, I would act, I actually have interest in. I, I keep trying to buy tiles, but they're 
so marked up, I don't. But the reason I'm interested in Gibraltar is because they have a cohesive unit. They have a cohesive game plan there, and they're going they're going to get the Earth 2 traffic. So for me, that's of interest. But like Holy C, I, I don't see the appeal for it other than that there's just so few tiles mm-hmm. there. Well, I mean, exclusivity, exclusivity, there, there's always something to be said for it. And I, you've already seen some of the tremendous investments made in Holy See, but but it's to be determined whether or not those investments bear out compared to, you know, what you could do with, say, $5,000 invested elsewhere, um, you know, spread across the globe as opposed to maybe trying to buy uh, the casino in Monaco or something like that, right, which was <laughs> recently subject to a huge purchase, so... Um, you know, I think that anytime you've got people throwing this sort of money at individual properties, it's, it's exciting because you have to assume there's, or hope there's some vision beyond, you know, pure speculation, but who knows? So, um, mm. you know, cause I, I'm admittedly somebody that does also have quite a few tiles in this, uh, strategy, um, but not in any of the sort of a class lands. I don't have any land tiles, in um, Gibraltar or in Monaco. So I have, you know, like 600 class one tiles in Tuvalu though. Um, So I'm hoping that this works out for me. I've certainly invested uh, my little bit of money uh, in that direction. But, you know, I do think one thing I do worry about um, with the strategy is is land income tax is gonna be lower. Not that that's a big deal at all, but it is a slightly, it is one thing that should be noted just because there can't be that many people buying in the nation on an ongoing basis. If you have that low of a supply of tiles. Um, And then you also have an inherently smaller community size in a lot of cases. And to that earlier point about sort of a cohesive vision for a mega city, I don't know that everybody buying in San Marino has many plans for what to do with those tiles other than, you know, hoard them and hope that they increase in value because of their rarity. So I'm I'm curious how those communities will actually look when we get into the game, and that's that is also kind of supporting Hazy's point about Gibraltar. Well, mm-hmm. well, Hydra Hydra has Holy Sea tiles. So tell us kind of what you your reason for buying the tiles there, and how you envision those tiles. Yeah, no operate. problem. Um, look, I, I think you know Holy Sea is obviously very aspirational, and, and I've 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 got to, I've got to say that I did always want them when I when I came into the game. So we'll just put the bragging rights aside. <laughs> um, <laughs> but I think that the interesting thing about Holy C is you, you're very, you're very true that there is a small community lit, lit, lit is going to be low, but the, the Holy C itself is sitting in one of the biggest mega cities already in the game being Rome right in the center. It has the advantage of being a very small block of land it has its own Discord server um, with all of the players in it, that, are, that are invested in there sitting in the server itself. Ah, yeah, I didn't it, know that. And I That's would say that it's relatively easy for a coordinated investment in something sexy to be created, which would then spill out to provide hopefully benefit and also attraction for Rome itself as as an investment and i think that's that's really the unique thing about holy sea um in in, at least in my opinion and and that small user base gives an element of control to what that development would be because obviously you know a relatively large amount of investment's gone in there and people do want to see it succeed by nature yeah, I think that that's a very good point. And I, I think to a lesser degree too, Monaco carries some appeal just because of its proximity to to France. Not necessarily in the same way, but it does have some of that appeal of basically being a, a nation within a nation or a nation that's you know adjacent to another uh, popular sort of uh, high foot traffic type area. Whereas certainly your smaller island nations by nature of being islands are not going to be, you know, directly bordering anything uh, of, of high value itself, unless you're really fond of water tiles and, and there's no shame in that. Oh, the Kraken love water tiles. Yeah. Mate, so. <laughs> <laughs> I know not to bash it in your presence. So. <laughs> Praise well, me. What a sale. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> but, but that's, that's interesting. It's um, I, I had not had an opportunity to really pick anybody's brain about, you know, Holy sea tiles. So it's interesting to, to hear you, um, 
you know, talk about sort of the long-term vision and that ability to, to control um, the outcome for that nation a little bit more just because there are so few properties. Mm. So the one, the one thing I want to bring up is why is Nauru a struggle for, for people? Because it's one of the smaller countries. Is it because of the price tag? I've always assumed that it has to be because uh, for, for those that are unaware, Nauru has, is far more expensive than other nations that, are, that have similar numbers of tiles sold for, for reasons I'm not totally clear on, um, but have some idea as to why. But in any case, even though it's still class one, the tiles are two plus dollars uh, per, if I'm not mistaken. And so there's still quite a few land tiles available for that reason. But I'm not interested in spending that kind of coin, even though there is that exclusivity. It's just, frankly, it's too expensive for what you're getting. Yeah. So, what would happen if class, if we if a uh, resource was come out and we find out that class one has even more value than we thought? Those well, then you're then you there. might see a rush on. You know, you're going to see a marketplace rush on C1, and you you're going to see some folks go to Nauru because it is the only, if I'm not mistaken the only place currently open where you can still buy fresh C1 tiles. So that, that would be interesting. That is, that is correct. Well, yeah. you know, uh, talking about sort of these longer term visions for places like Holy See, Tuvalu um, has got me, you know, I think that transitions well into our next topic, which is sort of the, the strategy of our investments and the idea of withdrawing versus holding specifically as it relates to a startup investment. Um, so, you know, I think to get this started, Hydra, I'd like to you know, kick this over to you and ask sort of what you, you know, what's your strategy when it comes to investing in a startup and what do you think those fundamentals are and what does that look like when applied to earth Two? How are you applying those fundamentals in this circumstance? Sure. So I look up, I think firstly, before in investing in, in anything personally, I, I do like to do my research. Um, as, as obviously, you know, stated earlier, I, I had the um, benefit of getting a kick up the ass to do that because of my work situation, which was, which was cool. But, um, you know, I think it's, it's about firstly knowing who you're investing in, both in terms of the team, the company, where the company's based, what the legal system that you know surrounds that company is, where its accounts are held, if you can find that information, etc. Um, I think then it's really about how much do you want to invest, and it's it's about you know, and you will hear this time and time again from me: invest what you can afford. And you know, I know you guys have said this a number of times as well. So, I think they're really the two rules that I go into with with any investment. Um, I think, you know, startups are always going to be high risk, you know, whether it's Earth2 or whether it's a startup neo bank or, 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 or anything really, it's, it's always a high risk investment. And, and, you know, I think if we look at significant amount of companies fail within their first one year, two years and five years, and I think those stats um, at a country level are published, you know, quite readily by a number of corporate regulators. Um, I think in terms of in terms of earth two uh, look i've i've really invested what i can afford um there's a there's a little bit of addiction element there as you can probably see but 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 really <laughs> oh I, I totally relate i did the same thing i did I, I went in planning on doing maybe yeah. one or two thousand ended up throwing in fifteen thousand so <laughs> yeah <laughs> it resonates very clearly with me um, I think it, look, on that basis I actually reinvest everything um, that I that I make from flipping or or anything like that and, and I think you see a lot of that strategy with with other players like my saw predict um, Willie Malik etc so you know, I think fundamentally, I've done my research. As far as I'm concerned, I believe in what the team are, are trying to do. Um, and I'm very supportive of, of where they're going with this, both in terms of, you know, a game, um, a platform and, you know, and, and, and the features that, you know, that at least they've articulated on that platform. So that's kind of my position. In, in terms of withdrawals, um, yeah, as I said, my, my strategy has been reinvesting. Um, 
I understand in the market um, for crypto investments or generally investments, there is a real desire to exit your initial investment up front. And I think that is a sound strategy. Um, and, you know, I, I, what I do have an issue with about withdrawals is, you know, people coming in, pumping and dumping and then withdrawing the entire thing and leaving their user base of followers in the lurch. So when it, when it comes to their mega cities or when it comes to, you know, the, the interest that they previously drummed up. And that's the real issue that I have in this. <laughs> yes. You to the bus. <laughs> yes, exactly. Exactly. Like if you're going to put it out there, if you're going to, if you're going to get people invested in you personally and in your strategy, like at least come to the party and hold something. Like I know, you know, look, maybe hold 10,000, maybe hold 20,000 to say, hey, guys, I'm stepping back from a bit, but, hey, I'm still keen to be involved. I, I'm still keen to put the time in making this a success. Don't just walk away, and that's the problem that I have. Yeah, well, there's definitely, I mean, I think that we all have goals for and hopes for what the, the game will look like, but there's some very real uh, financial hopes tied up in it. And even knowing the strategy uh, and living by the strategy of only investing what, uh, you can afford to lose. There's, you know, I think that there's some some emotional attachment from some of us that just want to see the project succeed. So those stories are, you know, ultimately harmful to anybody that bought in on those things. Where now the, you know, maybe the the price of the nation in which that mega city you know, was happy, you know, is is now far above what it realistically should be, and folks are, you know, left sort of holding that land without a potential way to, to move on from it. So, you know, my hope is that this project is ultimately as successful, I think, as we're all, <laughs> as our, our fingers are crossed and we're all hoping it is so that, you know, even with some of those sort of dubious events, um, folks aren't, you know, folks still ultimately end up benefiting from having invested in the project so early on. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so I've taken out 1300, uh, uh, the first 300 I did kind of as a test and the second thousand I did because actually I deposited money to buy a piece of property. And right as soon as I deposited, I sold land. So I just basically took my money back out. But Kangi, I know you just have uh, put a withdrawal through. Kind of explain why you're doing it and what your reasons are. I'm typically of the hold variety like like Hydra. Uh, I reinvest, but I did take a little out, but only for it wasn't what I thought was a substantial. Right. And, and the reason I'm withdrawing is really two reasons. Um, so I have invested, I think somewhere under just under 4k and then have sold and, and reinvested multiple times over, but I am pulling out um, $2,000 in part to um, actually give a finder's fee to uh, the person that got me into this, who could use it for their small business. So um so that that is part of it but i also wanted to i i don't know that i come from the exact same background as as hydra but i do come from a financial services sort of compliance background um so i do want to test the withdrawal process and sort of see you know i, I assume that they're running my name through like ofac checks and um going through my sort of transaction history within earth 2 so doing this early withdrawal to sort of you know, see how long that process takes since my account's been very active is interesting to me because I do think I'll, I'll potentially be one of the people that has to wait a bit longer for withdrawal just because I have done transactions with so many different users, you know, through, throughout the last um, four months. So Hydra, do you ever plan on withdrawing or are you going to <laughs> hold until you retire? Um, at this stage, I don't have any plans to withdraw. All right. Simple as that. That is a, an affirmative hold strategy if there ever was one. <laughs> yes. Well, but one of the benefits of people who do cash, who are kind of looking to cash out, and I, I know I've taken advantage of it, Kangi's taken advantage, I'm sure you've taken advantage of it too, Hydra, is when they are looking to cash out, they're putting their property up for massive discounts. 50, 60% off. By now, I want out, I want out. And that's the time we can swoop in and take advantage of it because we believe in the game and, and we don't, we're not going anywhere. So 
even with some of the question marks we have, this is a great opportunity to make money from people's uh, yeah, I mean, I, I I've say. gone out and bought, and I n never thought this would be the case when I had joined in December, but I've gone and bought American tiles on the marketplace for under $10 per, which is sort of like the the Earth 2 equivalent of buying the dip, right? This is a, a huge <laughs> discount against market value. So that person no longer believes in the property. I still do. So perfect. Good opportunity for me and they get a chance to cash out and you know in most cases those people are still selling at a, at a profit or at least at what they had bought it for so they're able to to exit without you know taking a, a big loss or anything like that in most cases it's very true it's very true and that that i think you know at a number of points over the past couple of months there have been certain dips which have allowed a lot of players um, and you'll see some of them in the top 50 to, to really capitalize on, on the, on the discounts, just like you're saying. So, you know, I think there, there are positives and, and minuses um, to the, to the, to the reinvestment strategy, but there that, you know, I think you can definitely keep your eye out for a lot of good, um, you know, competitive offers and pricing on, on some really well-located properties if you're there at the right time and with the, the right sniping eyes on. That's good advice from, from a, a leading expert in the community. So anybody listening to that, definitely uh, take a word of advice from, from Hydra and surf that marketplace and try to find you know, some well-located plots from somebody that might be liquidating their profile. But uh, you know, on that note, I think uh, I'm looking at my clock here. We're less than 24 hours away from where we would normally sort of see our classic Shane Saturday announcement. Uh, and you know, the expectation coming into this weekend was that we'd hopefully get some phase two uh, related stuff, Essence and EPL on uh, April 17th. But Shane's got some tweets today. Uh, and Hazy, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to actually kick it to you to start this one because I know that you did the recap. Uh, what did Shane have to say today and what does that mean for our phase two launch? Oh, excuse yeah, me. So yes, he the didn't tweet it I'm out, sorry. He, uh, <laughs> yeah, he, he jumped on the discord in the gen chat and basically he said they have some big, big news that they want to, so they're going to have to kind of hold off on the essence and EPO because they want to roll it out with this big news. So therefore, and this doesn't surprise me. I, I never thought it was going to happen this weekend. Uh, I said that on the last podcast. So uh, what he did say, I will post a tweet tomorrow. Essence and EPLs are 100% ready to launch, but something really big came up. And if we delay it, we'll benefit every landholder on E2, E2 significantly long term. So, of course, he's vague. Like Shane always is. He always has and kind of like, I think, <laughs> must be an Australian <laughs> thing. <laughs> Hydra and Shane, deliberately secretive. <laughs> yeah, it keeps the interest up, I guess. Yeah, there you <laughs> Yeah, so, uh, so that, so, and then uh, I'm trying to see where else he, he said one other thing I wanted to find. Yeah, well, I mean, <laughs> go, as go you're looking for right. that, you know, I think that this signed it, kind of dovetails with, um, you know, the, the gigantic announcement that, Epic Games made regarding their investment in a metaverse as well. So you know, even leading up to today, you've seen a lot of Earth 2 users in the Discord, you know, talking about whether sarcastically or seriously, you know, imploring uh, Earth 2 to team up with Epic Games to be a part of uh, this sort of, you know, I guess in, in their eyes would be a joint metaverse. Uh, but it does speak to you know, the, the increased competition in this space. We have another major player with a billion dollar investment um, trying to, to enter this space as well. And uh, I don't know how many metaverses can exist. I don't know what the overall appetite's going to be, but it's certainly huge news for the, you know, for this industry as a whole to have this sort of investment. And you've got to think that it, it, it at least brings positive attention yeah. from other investors to things like Earth 2. But it is also huge competition, right? Yeah, I don't know if it's positive for her too or not. You know, I asked Shane about this. So someone asked him his thoughts on Epic, and he said uh, he wasn't really worried. And so I said, you're not worried about Epic? Uh, you don't think you should be? They raised a billion dollars. That's a lot of capital. And they have the manpower that Earth 2 doesn't have. 
I'm not worried about what you can do. I'm worried they are going to do it faster and that the man for a two will be squashed. And he actually answered my question. So I'll read this real quick. This is what Shane said. I didn't say I am not worried, but I am not for the record. We have our plan and we are going to follow through. I don't see this as a bad thing for us at all. Not sure you're fishing for an article here, but I thought what they are doing look cool apart from the there are many things we know which we are working on that they likely won't have and even if they do our plans account for that i don't see them as competitors to our overall vision and internal plans that and 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 that's a good good response and he's always been really articulate when it when these type of questions come up but i still worry that if Epic decides to roll something out in two years, they can do it a lot better than what Earth 2 development team can because of the manpower and money they have. It's, it's an interesting, it's an interesting thought, right? Like I'm going to, I'm just going to draw one parallel back to financial services industry, right? So, you know, there is a reason why banks and large players have million dollar support and investment portfolios in their IT services development and new product development versus startups coming in with, I don't know, let's just say $500,000 capital and completely disintermediating them from certain spaces. And I think a really good example of this is probably, I don't know, if you guys have Afterpay in the US, I think you do. Um, you, you really see Afterpay coming in with a tiny, small company and generating, you know, billions of dollars of market cap over a period of, you know, six to 12 months versus, you know, let's just say Australian banks and, and other, you know, US banks are, are just now providing buy now, pay later services. So I think there's an element of cost um, in, the element, in, the, in the Epic Games thing. So, you know, $1 billion is great, but, but how much of that is, is, you know, really reflective of their corporate inefficiency? I think the second part is, well, you know, how much value is there in the headway that Earth2 have already got in their strategy to disrupt this space and create a platform? You know, really, I think similar, well, essentially similar in the way that Epic have articulated theirs, um, you know, we're with similar features and stuff and, and already a committed and engaged early adopter user base. Yeah, well, I think one thing that that Earth Two will certainly, you know, they they've played everything very close to the vest, and ultimately, you know, they've they've got Shane and his vision, and <laughs> as far as I know, other than a few other people, you know, there's not a lot of other folks that know exactly what those plans are. So everybody can have a plan for a metaverse, but what that actually contains, and what your gameplay elements are, and what your money making elements are, um, I think is what's really going to separate you know these products from one another. So. Hopefully our boy Shane's got the, got the, the best plan. Um, I still feel very confident, and I do ultimately think it'll be a, a positive thing to have this much money enter the space, even though it's you know, ostensibly it's competition. Yeah. And Shane did just fly to the United States and had a big meeting. Uh, so there is that. So we don't know what's going on behind closed doors. So we kind of just have to expect that, they brought in some big people. They know they, they have a long-term vision. They're not trying to rush this. So we need to keep the faith. Um, we need to keep going. So I, I do know we've been talking for a while, so we need to wrap this up. Uh, Hydra, really appreciate you coming Thank on. Thank you very much for having me, gents. It's much appreciated. It's been great. Yeah, I had a great time. All right. All right, great. So this was the My Name is Human Earth2.io podcast brought to you by E2.news. Thank you for listening. Uh, please like, subscribe, follow us wherever you're at. Uh, we do appreciate it, and we'll see you next time. If you haven't heard about Anchor, it's the easiest way to make a podcast. Let me explain. It's free. There are creation tools that allow you to record and edit your podcast right from your phone or computer. Anchor will distribute your podcast for you so it can be heard on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and many more. You can make money from your podcast with no minimum listenership. It's everything you need to make a podcast in one place. So download the free Anchor app or go to anchor.fm to get started today. Get up off your